This is the fourth and final um, uh, session in our, I think, very important um, series on scientific integrity that we've had through this calendar year. And I'm working with some of the other faculty now to think about some themes that we will do next year on different types of academic topics. Um, but I think this has been a very important for one for us to tackle this year. And we've heard already uh, several sessions that deal with research integrity issues in both the, sci in both the basic science and the translational uh, research areas. So I'm very pleased to turn it over now to Dr. Eiji Safar. He's a professor of pathology and one of our um, uh, prominent neurodegeneration researchers. So Eiji, thank you for taking on this session. Thank you, Cliff. Um, I um, will try today to put together the perspective, you know, we uh, already have heard uh, from the previous three uh, presentations. And uh, I think that uh, there is a growing uh, feeling that uh, science uh, is under uh, fire, under a barrage of uh, attacks from different sides. So I think that science as a, which I consider still very noble uh, mission, has to defend itself. And I think that the uh, presentation today, I hope, will show the way how to address the questions and issues and how to prevent the uh, issues which I think are constantly circulating in the internet and some of the other sources. It doesn't move my slides, so. Uh, okay. So I will link uh, all my presentation to the previous one, and I think that uh, uh, Sof uh, uh, Sophia uh, uh, and uh, uh, Joe Wills and uh, uh, other already. Sorry. Thank you. Okay. So you'll have to just kind of click in the corner. Okay. So can we get it? Yeah. Okay. So I think that uh, overall. Um, I would like to cover a couple of points. So one of them is the concern about reproducibility and scientific rigor, why we are asking those questions and what we are discussing them. And uh, specifically, what is the NIH and general responses, how the rigor and grant applications applies to the lab and operation and uh, submission of the papers. And foundation of all those aspects is the laboratory data management, and I will spend significant time on those. Last, training and resources. I think that uh, receiving NIH uh, funding currently is linked to those aspects and uh, they specifically ask how we are going to transfer those knowledge and that uh, specific features and specific uh, strategies uh, to our trainees. And finally, well, the critical, what is the critical role of the mentor and PI? So, I think that science is a really important uh, tool. Now, there are different discussions about what specific aspects of science are important and more important than the other side. But I think that I would like to quote in this context uh, one of the leading uh, rationalist philosophers of science, uh, Karl Popper, who focused his attention to the process not the outcomes and whether or not the theory is correct or not, but whether it is the process itself, whether it is and if it can answer the questions which uh, are asked. So this idea is that science is an evolutionary process. 
characterized by the simple uh, formula. When you have problem, you formulate it, you generate some tentative, theory, tentative theories, and then you start process of elimination. The next, you generate more and more interesting problems. But in this aspect, the error elimination, I think, is really absolutely essential. So his idea about science is that scientific theory or scientific uh, proposal is only valid if it covers two important aspects. One, which is basically saying that, uh, which corroborates the idea and beer is out. And the second, which he considers even more important, the basic statements which are inconsistent and prohibits it. So in other ideas, which statements or conditions in the experimental setting in the lab will falsify the theory or the proposal. And both are totally dependent on the uh, rigor and reproducibility. If you don't have solid data, and the data which are reproducible, unbiased experimental methodology analyzes the interpretation and the reporting, it uh, basically invalidates either one of those statements or both. So, in history, you hear a lot of opinions about it, about the science being uh, self-correcting. So, in the long term, it's correct. If somebody publishes the data, and later they are not reproducible again and again, it basically uh, itself sort itself out. But the short-term damage can be very significant, and we have seen it recently. It leads to the reproducibility problem, it increases the cost, time, resources, and it costs sometimes the careers and careers and public and public confidence. So there was an interesting paper last September in Nature, and the Retraction Watch uh, published some of the statistics. So the question is, is this system, the uh, self-correction system, is it really working? Can I get rid of the upper bar or move the slide out? Anyway, so the bottom line is that uh, the retraction watch uh, published some statistics. So if in 2010 there was about 45 retraction a month, in 2022 it was about 300 retractions, and in 2018, from 2018, uh, from uh, since uh, 2018, over uh, 35,000 retractions. So. In those numbers, the, uh, apparently, the statistics show that there is an increase in number of retracted papers. So you can look at it as a positive signal, saying that uh, it's a sign that science is working and uh, scrutinizing, scrutinization and uh, rigorous uh, evaluation of the papers is actually doing the job. And that the uh, retraction, total retraction, may be under 0.1%. Uh, now, if you look at it from the other side, and you can see and look in the database and surveys and studies and reports, the authors, uh, the authors of this paper uh, counted that one in 50 papers may have some flaws, and it can go anywhere from the uh, errors in the methodology, statistics, the uh, problems with the uh, plagiarism, and some of the other problems. Retraction Watch, in final conclusion, says that uh, they feel that the scientific community is falling short. So what is the source of those problems? And I think that there are two uh, uh, aspects which are working sometimes together. Publication practices are becoming uh, really an uh, issue, and I think that negative findings are difficult to publish very often. The uh, overemphasis of the uh, exciting and big picture findings is also uh, obviously a problem. Publishing, a, there is a growing number of predatory journals which uh, have fake peer reviews or basically no peer reviews, so that's another issue. And there is a new generative AI applications which specifically in the images make it very difficult to evaluate the veracity and uh, conclusions of the paper. Now, on the other side, it's uh, history. We have now facing historically low funding rates at NIH, and uh, some of the 
uh, pay lines for R01 are approaching single digits. And I was looking at the NID last week, and it's eight percentiles. NINDS, 11. So that's increasing the uh, pressure for sci on scientists very dramatically. Grant reviews and promotion are also depend too much on high-profile publications. So how to deal with all those different aspects and put together the foundations which I will talk about later, which are the laboratory data management. I think that we are, and you as investigators, you are not alone. I mean, there is a NIH uh, help in a significant way, and some of the uh, aspects they uh, put in place are preventing uh, a lot of issues and helping to solve them. There is an Office of Research Integrity, which is also helping to get together the structures and uh, proposals which would help to address the problems. And there is, of course, Case Western and administration and the office which uh, has, are submitting the grant application and some of the uh, other aspects which is helpful. And finally, there are journals. But ultimately, and that's uh, the guy in the box, is the function of PI and individual investigator. I mean, it has to be uh, 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 clear that the PI and mentorship in this case play absolutely critical role uh, in all those different steps. So the data integrity and management don't, doesn't start with submission of paper. It actually starts with submission of grant. So rigor, scientific rigor and uh, integrity is part of the evaluation. So in the start, uh, starting in the R01 applications, you are evaluated in uh, research strategy and then approach and then attachments with the uh, authentication, authentication of the biological and chemical resources. All those different aspects have, uh, are counted into the uh, uh, final uh, scoring, and they have very important. Uh, cont they contribute very importantly to the final uh, evaluation and final score, and therefore funding. So, uh, for the rigor, I think that the bottom line is that we need to uh, assess the strengths and weaknesses of the rigor in the prior published research. And I think that critique and open discussion on the subject is uh, absolutely critical. So is the observation, preliminary data, and published literature. And I think the description of the weaknesses and rigor is counted, counting for improve, improving the uh, uh, scores. The prior research, again, has to take into account the appropriate sample size, randomization, adequate positive, negative controls, appropriate statistical tests, consideration of rel relevant biological variables, authentication, and other measures. The strict application of the methodology and robust, uh, uh, unbiased experimental design is absolutely critical for the research proposal, and I think that I don't need to discuss that. You need to discuss clearly what is planned, and I think that the positive and negative outcomes and critique and also uh, the uh, solution to the problems which will predictably happen is a critical point of the evaluation. In the animal experiments, I think that and, uh, in a biological setting, sex, age, weight, underlying health conditions are absolutely essential to discuss and, and uh, disclose. Now, if you have only one sex in your proposal, you need to really justify it, and you have to make absolutely sure that it's clearly understood that it's not a variable which would impact the data. The authentication of the biological and chemical resources is almost automatic part, and there is a special form for it. It's not part of the evaluation of the scoring of an NIH grant, but uh, it's really important to go into every specific detail. So let's say that you submit the R01, and uh, that final, and there may be some data which were falsified, fabricated, and plagiarized. Do you think that you are liable for misconduct? Who think that he is, or who think that he is not? He is. 
Correct. So there was a decision in recently on two uh, applications which were shown to be uh, faulty, and uh, the uh, administrative judge, a law judge, uh, decided that uh, the PI, even if he is not available and responsible and directly involved in those uh, aspects, in those uh, problems, he is responsible. So what is the defense? Uh, basic data. Verify the raw data. That's the first step. The next step is to avoid in the images, using images or templates which are easy to replace and can get replaced inadvertently into something which you didn't want to disclose or was disclosed by somebody else without proper quote. Never uh, plagiarize, and that's obviously the quotation system. Now, the reliable data is really the bottom line, and that's the most, uh, I think, critical component of the proposal. And again, PI is responsible for those, and I will go later into how and how to manage those data. The foundation of all those aspects, the scientific rigor, is the uh, good laboratory notebook and the uh, activity which is related to it. Laboratory notebook has to contain the tangible data like gel, slide, photograph, and computer printouts, and intangibles, observations, conclusions, extrapolations, uh, hypothesis, hypothesis, and uh, the uh, quantification of some peaks or scans or whatever else. They can be bound or unbound and uh, electronic files or any other format. And any human subject records have to, of course, uh, follow the uh, public, uh, the personal uh, health identifier. And Joe Wills presented uh, a specific uh, uh, lecture on that aspect, so I will not go there. So current research uh, is dealing with two aspects which are dramatically increasing the volume of data. First. It's not a single investigator locked in the room and you know, looking into the microscope. There is always uh, collaborations and large teams. Second, the data generated now takes more and more space. And it's, it can be imaging data, it can be mass spec, it can be uh, any other electron, cryo-electron microscopy. So all those require uh, not uh, just paper uh, follow-up and, and tracking, but also uh, digital tracking, electronic records. So in general, I think that all those records related to the uh, lab book should be legible, clear, timely, thorough, complete, secure, backed up, and well-organized. Right? So responsibilities. I think that uh, this is the recommendation which uh, uh, is not anywhere written in stone, but I think that is probably what is coming from general uh, uh, submissions and from NIH, NIH recommendations. Personal computer is good only for short-term storage and data processing. For all the reward data, including negative results, and I think that it's really important to consider, Collecting by individual investigators should be stored in the appropriate cloud server for a minimum five years and ideally in perpetuity. All the data are recommended in the lab books, uh, are recorded in the lab books, are stored in the lab for a minimum five years and ideally in perpetuity. All persons designated as authors should qualify for authorship and all those who qualify to be listed should have access to the raw data. Last point, I think, is that each author who is participated to participate sufficiently in the works takes public responsibility for appropriate portions of the content. So how to do it in the practical sense? I think that uh, this is the challenge, because most of the uh, generic service, including those available at uh, CASE, have main goal, and that's data loss prevention. Now, that generates uh, in a, inadvertently a lot of issues for the investigators. One is that uh, the uh, multiple, many, many different customers for those servers require very rigid and simple access system and prioritization, which is not by, by definition very flexible and it cannot be very flexible. 
Now, the total cost of ownership, again, it has to be uh, uh, manageable by the institution. So it is limiting the way how to build out the software and how the, how the server can operate. Additional problems are content sprawl. So if you drop everything what you have in that, in, that, in that server, you will suddenly have a lot of files which are very difficult to manage and you have no idea how to and where they were generated and how they got there. And importantly, it's a one-way perimeter defense. So the data loss prevention is driving the security and all the access issues in the one way. And you cannot really do many changes in that, in that aspect. So ideally, I think that uh, a lab, uh, electronic lab uh, book should, be, uh, should allow uh, file sharing and collaboration. It uh, uh, has to be uh, controlling the data. Access uh, governance is extremely important and it has, uh, uh, it has to be flexible. And privacy and compliance standards has to be implemented. The data loss prevention again, has to be uh, uh, instituted. And the last thing, which I think is important for flexibility and for the rapid uh, science we are facing now, is the flexibility. So this is an example of one of those uh, uh, electronic uh, servers, data, uh, data laboratory book servers. Uh, Ignite is just one of those which are uh, available. So. In the first uh, aspects, uh, which uh, it is on the cloud server, and in the first aspect is the security, and that's responsible for the provider. In this case, for example, as an example, Ignite. So they provide the security and threat detection and ransomware protection, and all those aspects are you are getting as a package uh, from them. What is really important and that's the availability of you as a PI be in control of the data flow in and out and who has access to what, into the what level. So from the administration down to the individual investigator, you can assign a very specific access level and data manipulation or not, or just reading. So there are very, very important specific steps you can assign as a PI for very specific functions. Now, uh, the privacy and compliance, most of those uh, available uh, on the, on the, in, the private, uh, in the private servers and private companies have uh, compliance with uh, privacy and with the PHI and uh, uh, because they are serving uh, to the science as well as the health institution. Data access management, and I think that that's a really critical part because it can help to make sure that your data are protected and they are as raw as possible for the future storage. And I think that that's a very, very critical point to all those previous aspects I mentioned. Life cycle management, so you can assign timeline for specific files and specific folders and then let them go. So that's another important, uh, important aspect. So you clean it organized, you have it organized and you have it in a very specific way uh, assigned. The last point is the uh, seamless collaboration. Some, mo most of those servers allow, first of all, they have integrated uh, software like Microsoft, so you can operate in real time, in, on the cloud, processing papers and plots and data for the specific, let's say, specific publication. So all those aspects are already integrated into that cloud service. The, uh, that's a very important component for collaborating. So if you have a, for collaboration with additional external groups, so if you have multiple different aspects, uh, multiple different users, I mean, this is the way how to assign specific roles and then coordinate writing and processing data and publishing paper. There are many of those. I mean, some of them are available for a long time. Some of them are new. So for example, this one is uh, the laboratory information management system by Labware. The one, uh, and I have to state that I have no conflict of interest. I'm using this Ignite for 10 years now. And uh, so it's available and it's reliable and I don't have any negative experience with it. 
and it's about 16,000 subscribers. And again, you have uh, communication from anywhere, anyhow, so you can use your handheld, you can use your laptop at home, you can use the computer here at Case. So ef effectively, you are constantly linked to your raw data and storage and handling of those, and they are protected to a very high level. There are additionally the bench link, for example, that's used by Moderna and some of the other companies, and uh, effectively it can integrate with the Ignite, so that's the another software I already mentioned. Dotmatix, uh, Dotmatix, that's another one. Uh, so there is now a lot of those, uh, of those uh, companies, and I think that providing the cloud services like that, and the question is what will be the best fit for your group, for a number of people, what data you are storing, and what you want to uh, work with the collaboration in other groups and how to coordinate it. So it's a complex issue. There is not one recipe, one company, one system which would fit everybody in this department. Now, so the question is the how flexible that specific service is which would accommodate the most of the people. And that's, I think, for the discussion for which I think already started, and I think that we will have to look into the different options and then make a decision. So, can I ask a question? Sure, yeah. I mean, I didn't bring it with, I mean, we have, we are still using paper, okay? And, but it's basically the uh, uh, roadmap and the data uh, link to the data on the server. So every investigator in my lab generates lab book on paper. In the first page, there are dates, specific experiments, and files and folders where you can find them on the electronic lab book. That's probably the best system. So it gives you security with regard to the uh, uh, tracing back specific data, and it's very quick. And I think that it's good for all the collaborators in the lab because they can share and communicate data and then discuss them and so on. So that's probably the best option. So five terabytes on these, I, I cannot give, quote the others, okay? I can quote you the specific cost for the Ignite. So five terabytes for five investigators cost uh, $600 for a year. Now, um, uh, there is a problem because uh, that has to be paid by the credit card. They don't accept uh, the uh, standard uh, uh, transfer of the money because they, uh, the cut, cutoff for them is $12,500. So in other words, if we would have 20 users in our department, we could set up the account and it would become vendor and we could basically uh, have it packaged. Otherwise, uh, case doesn't allow to pay for software and outside computer services by credit card. That's the current uh, issue. Yeah, Cliff. Uh, you mentioned that um, perhaps it would be hard to uh, have a single solution work for everybody. But uh, I would ask, you know, um, you know, there's going to be some percent, you know, 10 percent, I don't know what it is, that are really specialized types of work that somehow don't mesh with you know, these particular solutions. But I have my opinion about the question I'm asking, but do you want to respond to the concept that it would be advantageous for a department like ours or an institution like ours to converge on a common system for at least most of the work? I think my personal opinion is that it would be beneficial. And uh, for 12,500, we would need 20 users. Now, there are practically, there are uh, groups which are handling huge amount of data. Alison Krauss with uh, cryo-electron microscopy and many other people are working on mass spec and imaging data. Confocal, in my case specifically, is take a lot of space, the original raw data from confocal microscopy. So I think that um, in my case, the five terabytes for my group worked just fine. And that was still leaving a lot of space for other people who can be plugged in, in time. Uh, 
Now, one of the advantages is that you can take people out and in practically immediately, just a question of clicking specific set settings in the assignments. So how to structure that, whether you use the five people, five terabyte component, or get in bigger and then assign specific people in the structure, I don't have an answer for that. Maybe a related question is, you earlier mentioned um, the increasing level of collaborative science. And how do you deal with, uh, when you collaborate with somebody else, you know, who may share the laboratory notebook system that you use versus when they do not? How do you manage that? I think that uh, based on the first, you know, slides I put in, I think that the access to the raw data is essential for collaboration. And I think that that answers your question. Uh, so Ignite allows access from outside. Let's say that we will have an account here, a department, but anybody outside can receive the access code name and for the server, for that service, and can access the data, including the raw data, as well as you as a PI, for example, here. Now, all the data are encrypted and all the data are highly protected. The specific one, the Ignite, and all the other are very, very protected. So, basically, I don't, I don't know about any uh, failure, uh, safety failure uh, in the past. Yeah, Here is there, uh, for example, moving forward for digital images, for example, with AI and digital performance uh, platform. There's a, there's a very large interest in having storage platforms that can be, that AI platforms can interact with and not having to move images out of a storage facility into another space, which is very difficult to do. So do, are there any particular advantages to one of these programs that allow integration with outside analytic platforms in with the storage modality uh, uh, of, the, of the suite of tools? The, for the Ignite I showed, yes, I had a webinar with them uh, about three weeks ago on that specific access. I mean, the question is how and whether and what would be the conditions for applying AI for mining the data already stored on that server. Now, there are security issues and they are fully aware of it, so it's not resolved yet, so there is not simple way to, uh, to, to answer your question, but it's in the process, that's what I mean. I think many of you are aware, but, the, but we at the department has a, a small working group that's starting to evaluate um, what we should do in this regard in, um, in the coming months, next calendar year. Um, I hope that we'll have some, some proposal to work on as a department. Yeah, thank you. So now, finally, you generate data. You have a solid lab book, so you have to publish. So. I think that uh, what is coming out, and it was driven originally by Nature, but now it's spilling in most of the other uh, journal, scientific journals, the, the rules, related to the <coughs> publication policy. And practically all the digital images have to be submitted in the form which are as close as possible to the raw data. Now, editors uh, may use, and they give it in the writing, may use the software to screen for manipulation. And that's effectively nature, and it seems to be also in science and some of the other uh, journals. Editors may request the unprocessed data files. And again, you know, this is going back to the lab book and the importance of storing all those raw data in long time. Based on the, some previous presentations, uh, you know, there were some uh, incidents uh, which came out 15, 10, 15 years after publication. So, if you have data, raw data stored, and you can defend yourself and you can eliminate all those doubts which somebody ha may have raised about your data and the reliability and reproducibility. So editors may request the unprocessed data, which means absolutely raw, non-processed data from the machine, from the confocal, from the mass spec, and so on. So independent experts can evaluate their uh, correct uh, uh, well value. They, uh, usually the editors recommend retaining the unprocessed data and again, ideally forever. And that's effectively the current, the current situation. 
About the jails, I don't know, go, um, uh, we don't need to go into the details. Everybody is probably aware of it, you know, what to do, how to publish, not cropped and not to use high contrast and all those other aspects which are basically generally now applied to most of the papers and publication in journals. About the confocal microscopical images, again, authors should be prepared to supply the editors with the original data, cells, multiple fields shouldn't be extra exposed, and so on and so on. So there are many, many detailed recommendations. Now, um, the responsibility for the data management and is uh, institutional, and I think that it's really important to understand that NIH, by uh, uh, transferring the funding to the Case Western Reserve University, Case Western has a responsibility for the uh, uh, aspects which NIH anticipates, so including the uh, data and the way how the institution, in this case, case will address the rigorous research design, data protection and storage. PI is, uh, is responsible for, in NIH uh, structure, responsible for instruction and methods and enhancing which are enhancing responsibility. And the same applies to the fellowships and individual career, career, career in, in development. So everything has to, is basically also or dedicated or delegated by NIH to the specific investigators and it applies to the T32 and all the other uh, training, training grants. So I think that the role of mentor and PI is absolutely critical. So the foundation is a scientific rigor. Now, it has to be done in the sensitive and balanced way. You don't want to generate paranoia, you don't want to generate feeling that you are a policeman and you will punish everybody for some mistake. I mean, the bottom line is that you need to simulate, stimulate creativity. And all those aspects, the rigor and creativity, are related to the uh, career uh, development. So. It's a very sensitive aspect, and I think that currently even more so because all those uh, 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 digital issues related to the digital data processing and applications are making those functions a little bit more complicated. Now, I think that foundation again, and I put it in this intentionally in the bottom, is the scientific rigor. So that's, I think, foundation of everything. All those institutions listed on this plot, which I pulled from the NIH Office of Research Integrity, are in collaboration. And you need to consider your role and the, how to facilitate, how to comply, and without impeding those aspects you have on that left component, that is the creativity and career development. Thank you. Yes. Uh, going back to the beginning of the seminar, you uh, have a quote from Carl Popper. Uh, he was well known for his concept of falsification, but within his own field of philosophy of science, a number of uh, other philosophers of science raised objections to the falsification. Falsification criterion as a way of demarcating science from non-science. So, I think personally that it's a valuable idea, but I think it's pretty clear that it doesn't work 100% of the time in the sense that there are always uh, ad hoc hypotheses that can be adduced. There are sometimes special circumstances. And there's the issue of the range of applicability. So for instance, I'm no physicist, but I know in physics, as far as I understand it, it is still not completely possible to reconcile general relativity on the massive scale of cosmic distances and quantum physics on the tiny scale. And they each have their range of applicability and they're incredibly precise in their predictions. And their predictions appear to be confirmed in both cases, but conceptually no one can put them both together completely. And I don't know if there's any examples in biology that are exactly like that, but you know, it's, it's a useful guide but I don't think it's 100% reliable. And in terms of his dichotomy of 
the two kinds of um, statements that a hypothesis or test can generate, I think you're going to run into issues there as well. So again, it's, it's, not, it's, it's not that it's all wrong, but I don't think there's any one completely reliable summary statement. I, I agree in general. I think that you know this is going for the discussion about uh, logic, logical positivism versus uh, rationalism of Karl Popper. So none of those are absolute, given absolute answers. What I pull, pull, uh, uh, what I stress in this case is the processor, processing aspects of our science, and the importance of the rigor, rig, scientific rigor to test the hypothesis. And I think that all those aspects you mentioned can be discussed. And I think that uh, none of those either logical positivists or uh, rationalists like Karl Popper are absolutely correct. And they would say that they are not. And I, have, I can send you some lectures of Karl Popper, you know, when he simply, simply stated that, you know, he's not making demand for absolute truth. I mean, he's not looking for, he's trying to sort, he, I'm quoting, he was trying to sort out science from pseudoscience. Right. Yeah. I mean, I, w I would just say that uh, your, your last word there is key, relentless questioning. Yes, exactly. Easy, this is a more general question. Um, back to the early part of your talk and the, and, and the issue of uh, achieving uh, rigor and statistical significance. Um, I'd just, uh, just like to have you comment on issues that I have seen even during this year from um, uh, grant proposals or grant proposals and development from our department. Um, where you know uh, achieving uh, an N um, to to result in statistical significance is difficult because it will cost too much, or difficult because it's a rare disease and there aren't enough samples. So, do you see any success in an NIH application that uses such arguments? Um, I think that. There is no perfect solution to it, and I think that uh, the idea is to lay out the data. <coughs> the preliminary argument for and against the N and sufficient, so you can make a, a claim that uh, you are not expecting to generate final data, but you are expecting to generate sufficient data which will later deal with the final, final profile. And or I mean the another option is to ask for increasing the budget, you know, over the five hundred <laughs> modular, but that's good luck. So, you know, there is no perfect solution. I think that it has to be tailored specifically for a specific problem. And I, I think that it's a definitely a problem. I agree with you. Because you cannot inflate the N and satisfy perfectly statistics by N by power power test uh, if it will cost five hundred thousand dollars. So it I think that if you can't achieve statistical significance, you can't make a, a real firm conclusion. Yeah. And I'm not sure that the NIH is interested in funding research that doesn't come, that can't come to a conclusion. Right. So, you know, I just think that we all need to be thinking about that, you know, there is sometimes are difficulties in, in achieving statistical significance, but those difficulties are not an excuse for um, you know, I don't, I don't think there's much future in NIH applications that can't lead to statistical significance. And I think some people are trying to fool themselves or, you know, because of the difficulty of that. Yeah, some things are difficult, but if they're, if they're impossible, then it's going to be hard to get them funded. I mean, one possible option is to scale down the application for a more preliminary one, like R21, R03, and some of these smaller packages, which are designed to generate preliminary data. But, you know, it's definitely a problem. Yeah, I agree. Any other questions? Are there any online? Okay. If not, then Iji, thank you very much for your talk, and I'd like to thank all the speakers uh, for the session this year and, and the audience for participating. Thank you all.